So our next speaker is a, uh, an engineer at Facebook who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, how Facebook uses uh, automation uh, to test their mobile apps. Please welcome Damien Sereni. Okay, uh, well thanks. Um, so we've heard a lot about like a bunch of really cool tools today, so since I'm the last speaker, I'm just gonna do something completely different, and I'm not gonna tell you about a tool at all. Um, so instead, I kinda wanna tell you a story. And it's a story about like this thing, which you, some of you recognize, this is Facebook.com. And well, you know, a few years ago, that's really the only thing we cared about, uh, building the website, Facebook.com, and that kept people busy. And well, of course, you all know the reason we're here, we still have Facebook.com, and then we have a whole bunch of different mobile apps as well and different platforms. So what I want to talk about is like how we're managing that transition uh, from being a primarily a web company uh, to being essentially a mobile company with a website. The other thing I want to talk about is managing growth in engineering. Um, so this is a slide I'd really like to start off with. Um, this is actually the number of commits that we have every month in our main PHP repo um, from like the beginning of time on Facebook scale, which is like 2006. Um, and what I really like is that this is growing incredibly quickly and it's growing as fast as we're adding engineers to the company. So an engineer that's joining now when we have, when we're like so much of a bigger company than we used to be is actually as productive as they were back in 2006 when there were only a handful of people around. So I think this is pretty cool. Um, and if, if you're wondering why there's like a huge dip in this graph, this is actually December of last year. We all went on holiday, so no one is committing anything. So the question is, how do we take this you know, success story of growing engineering for desktop and you know, do the same for mobile? That's what we're trying to do. So I want to tell you a little bit about how we do it for web and see, see where that takes us. So this is what you know, development for web, Facebook web looks like today, and it hasn't um, changed much. And this is like the life of a change to, a, to our web code base. And it starts off pretty simply in the developer's sandbox, so they write the code. Um, then it goes to code review. Every change at Facebook is always code reviewed. Um, then it gets into trunk. We don't have feature branches, we just have trunk. Um, eventually that trunk will get caught, caught into a release branch, and that makes it out to a billion users uh, pretty soon. And what's kind of important about this process is the engineer who wrote the code is actually responsible for the whole thing. So, we don't have a QA department at Facebook that's going to test the engineer's code for them. They have to write the test, they have to care about the results, and they have to maintain it all the way into production. If it breaks in production, they get woken up at 3 a.m. Um, so that's kind of something to keep in mind as I'm sort of describing some of these, uh, how, how we build code at Facebook. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the tools that we have for doing that for web. And it starts off with code review. Um, this is a very heavily edited screenshot from our uh, code review tool called Fabricator. Um, just a plug, it's open source, it's awesome, go and check it out. And um, if you had really, really good eyesight, what you could see is there's this one of the uh, lines in here. Basically says, okay, the developer made a change to the diff, and then a tool came back and commented and said like, hey, you have a new test failure. Um, you shouldn't commit it as, as it is. And what's happening here is that Every time someone submits a diff, long before it gets into trunk, we run all the tests on that diff and report the results back to them. So we make sure that they don't break anything before they get into trunk. But we don't make them wait for the results because like, they would get bored and you know, we let them get onto something else uh, while we run the tests for them. Another part of this is there's a little link at the top um, labeled Sandcastle. And that's really there to help the code reviewer. And what that does is if they click on that link, they actually go to the um, uh, UI, including the change that a person is trying to push. So we actually push the code out to a server and we serve it, serving it to the code reviewer so they can click around, try it out, really lightweight, and see what's, you know, whether they like the UI. So that's all great. Code gets reviewed, makes it into trunk. At some point, it'll get released. So when does that happen? Um, well, the simple answer is all the time. We release twice a day uh, on weekdays. Um, the slightly more complicated answer is what will happen to a change to a, a Facebook um, website code is if you commit it into trunk, on Sunday at 6 p.m., that'll go into the release branch. And that release branch lives for a couple of days until Tuesday, 
and then we release it out to the world. So the most you have to wait for to get your change from trunk into, release, into the production is eight days, give or take. Uh, and that's great, because it makes development way simpler. We don't have feature branches. We don't have time to get into dependency messes and complicated mergers and so on. But it does mean trunk has to work pretty much all the time. And that's why we care about unit testing um, early on in the process. So that takes us to you know, releasing the code into production, but it doesn't really stop there. Once the code is out into production, we've got to find out what it's doing. And we've got to find out if we have any problems on the website. So every single, uh, we basically instrument everything for servers at Facebook. And this is yet another heavily edited slide where it's actually the main dashboard for the health of the website. Um, and what we can do using that is you can push code out to a very small number of servers, say 2% of our servers, try it out, and we're literally within a minute of that, you can actually see whether any of our metrics are tanking and you know, realize there's a problem with the code before you've affected a significant number of users. So you know, this is kind of going from trunk to release to production. That's the story of how we actually managed to grow engineering for Facebook um, desktop, and we've become pretty good at that. So we kind of thought, well, it works for desktop. We should do the same thing for mobile. And well, that's what we did. And it was awesome. It was something called FaceWeb. Um, so for those of you who can sort of see uh, the screenshots there, this is you know, two iPhones with um, the, on the left, you have the iOS app as it would have been, say, in early August of this year, a few months ago. And on the right, you have a mobile site. And if you can spot a difference, well, we had that game earlier, but you know, we can play that again. Um, if you can spot the difference between them, um, you're really good, because there basically isn't any. Um, that's, yeah, OK. <laughs> there's a navigation bar at the bottom, and there's a like, photo thing at the top. Um, but the actual content is the same. And that's because the iOS app was basically built to be a very thin wrapper around a mobile website with some you know, JavaScript glue code to um, actually hook into native functionality so you could, well, take photos and do stuff like that. Um, and that was great. Like Everything we knew about building the desktop site and the mobile site, the mobile site is also incredibly important, we could just take that and, you know, that was mobile for us. So that was, that was really, really awesome. Um, I think it's fair to say at this point, it didn't quite work out the way we wanted it to. Um, this is a quote from our CEO at uh, TechCrunch Disrupt in September of this year. He actually called it one of the biggest mistakes we've made. Um, it really didn't work out. Um, and basically the reason for that is we could never get the level of performance and like native feel that we wanted out of that um, web view based, uh, based app. So, and you know, that cost us dearly. We had a, like two star approval, um, you know, approval rating from users in the iOS app store for quite a while. That's kind of embarrassing. So we threw all that away. Um, we rebuilt it, rebuilt it from scratch. The new Facebook iOS app is completely native, but that means Everything we knew about you know, developing code for web, well, now it doesn't apply anymore. So we had to start from scratch, rebuilding our engineering culture into something better. And since it's a Facebook talk, I have to have at least one meme. So you know, one just does not simply do the same for mobile. Um, we have another challenge on our hands. It's not just for native code. Mobile is also a lot more important than it used to be. So if you look in January 2009, I actually went that way, that far back in the repo, there was one person who committed to the iOS code. Like one person wrote the original Facebook iOS app. Um, this is like the trend of number of people who've committed to the iOS and Android repos at Facebook. And well, I did, I removed the scale, but um, it actually ends up being almost every engineer at this com every company. So we've gone from like a very small number of people who worked on mobile to nearly everyone is doing features for mobile. So we have to deal with that too. And you know that's kind of a problem for us because it, it has a bunch of challenges, which are probably different to some of the challenges that you might think of, but partly because the first one is the development tools are really, really heavyweight. So you have to realize that we, we have a culture of engineers who are writing PHP code for web. They you know, press save and then refresh, and they see their changes. They're not used to doing builds. They're not used to having to go, go through all these extra steps, and this is slowing them down. So that's kind of a problem for us. On the release side, we have another problem. Um, 
So I said we release Facebook, the website, twice a day. Uh, we could try releasing our app twice a day. I think our users would kill us uh, if we constantly told them to update it. Um, and even if we did, um, we have no way of forcing people to get off a release that's broken. So you know, we just cannot have the same release uh, strategy as we do for, um, for web. So this is kind of a story of how we're building, it, building a, something that works for mobile uh, within our engineering culture at Facebook. So let's talk about release a, uh, a little bit. So this is a pretty accurate description of the old release cycle um, for Facebook mobile, which was pretty much you kind of release it when it's ready, which pretty much translates to you never, ever release it, uh, because it's never ready, uh, hence the herding cats analogy. So that's gone. And this is what release for mobile actually looks like at Facebook now. We're on a four week, on a, ah, sorry. Um, well, yeah, we are on a four week release cycle. And what well, that means concretely is if I have a change, a little yellow dot of the uh, top left there, in the development branch, again, there's only, we're developing on one branch, then the most it'll have to wait to get into uh, the actual app is eight weeks. Four weeks of that, it might be living in the development branch. And then the other four week, it'll live in a release branch while the, uh, the app is being stabilized. So that's a really aggressive release cycle. It's not quite as uh, aggressive as our main website, where it was eight days, but you know, eight weeks isn't bad. So we're trying to get those changes out to people uh, as soon as possible. But that means we've got to be, when we cut that release branch from trunk, it's got to work. It's, you know, more or less. So the emphasis becomes, how do we keep Trunk stable while we're doing this? Well, let's take a look at how, how we actually um, achieve that. And as with uh, our website code, we have the same principle. The engineers are responsible for testing. We want the engineers to be writing the test and keeping um, Trunk to an acceptable level of quality. And this is kind of difficult to admit at a conference mostly about UI automation, but we actually decided not to start with UI automation. Um, and that was really because the most bang for the buck in terms of, as a first step, getting developers to uh, keep the trunk clean was still focused on unit tests. So that's our first step. So that's great, focus on unit tests, and get people to write tests and run them. Well, again, you have a problem that this is all very heavyweight. It's a really slow process to run all these tests and run the builds and so on. So what we decided to do instead was run all of this asynchronously, get the developers out of the way, they can focus on something else while we're running the test. So once they've written their code and they submit it for code review, we do the same thing that we do for web. We push it out to a whole bunch of build servers. They'll go crunch away, build all the apps, run all the unit tests, and then report back on the diff. And the developer isn't waiting for all this to happen. They can just move on to other things. Um, of course, we still want it to be as fast as possible, and uh, at least for the Android code base, there's actually a really cool tool uh, that we're using that I want to give a shout out to um, called RoboElectric. I don't know how many people are familiar with that. Um, but it's really neat. It lets you run Android unit tests without having to start up an emulator. So it will give you just enough of the Android library so that to work. Um, so we save a whole lot of time by not running uh, the Android emulator. So that sounds you know, really simple, and like conceptually it is. Um, there are a couple of challenges, because if you remember that you know, committers uh, graph, we have an awful lot of people writing an awful lot of diffs against this code base, so the builds are not happening on a Mac Pro under someone's desk. Um, actually, the builds are happening on things like that. Um, this is a uh, rack of 64 Mac minis um, that we had to you know, custom design and build for our data centers. Uh, this is the sort of infrastructure that we're uh, talking about when we talk about running offline, uh, offline builds. So that's great, we've got code review, and now um, you know, we've run all the unit tests, so the next question all developers always ask is, well, can I go play now? Um, unfortunately, there's still something really bad in the process, that the poor code reviewer, they see the code, they can like, read it and see the test results, but they gotta try it out, they gotta see what the UI looks like. And right now, they basically have to like, get the build from some server, find some way to get it onto their phone, you know, try it out, then they can report back on the diff and so on. This is a really lengthy cycle, which doesn't leave any time for playing on rib stakes. Um, so that's a bad thing, I want to fix that. Um, we're not quite there yet, but here's the idea. Um, 
we already have the code on our build servers, um, and why not make use of that? Why not actually run the app on those servers? So that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, what we're going to let reviewers do is just click on a link on the review page, open up a flash viewer on your browser, press play, kicks off an emulator on the, uh, in the build server, uh, and you can actually just try out the UI directly from the web browser. You don't have to do anything complicated with your phone and so on. Um, so this is kind of cool. We, uh, it's not built out yet, but it's coming from a company called Peaceable that we acquired recently. Um, and so hopefully we'll get that integrated soon and actually really want to open source it. So um, I think it's a really fun, uh, fun tool and it'll save a lot of time for developers. So that's kind of a um, big picture of a development cycle. So next I want to move on to what happens if that like, mysterious stabilization period. What are we actually doing when the app is being stabilized? Well, the main thing that we're doing is this. It's dog fooding. So I don't know how many of you can see this, but this is what you would see if you're a Facebook employee and you try to use a Facebook app. Uh, pretty much all the time, it'll just pop up a really annoying dialog box to tell you, hey, upgrade to a new version of the app. Um, that's because we're always running on internal builds, and we're constantly updating employees to the latest internal build uh, to try and get errors. During those four weeks, we have literally thousands of people using, using the app and finding errors for us. And we're on Facebook all the time, so this works pretty well. Of course, you know, we let people have manual uh, crash reports. It's, you, kind of, you shake your phone and it shows up a little dialog saying like, hey, you want to report a crash? Um, we obviously also record any actual uh, crashes that happen in the app, so we, um, we record all of those from employee builds, um, store them, find the right person to, uh, to assign the crash to, and then you know, automatically assign the task uh, to that person. So that's how we get the bugs fixed in the, uh, in the release branch. But what's really cool is we also aggregate this data. And we monitor how many errors are happening, how frequently the errors are happening on our release branch and our uh, development uh, master branch as, um, like in real time. So this is an example of uh, what that looks like. This is a graph of the rate of errors of different builds of uh, well, different branches of Facebook. Now, they're all, all reported by employees. So this is all employee uh, users, by the way. Now, the two little lines at the bottom are actually release branch, uh, release apps. We keep a few of our employees on release apps as a way of comparing against uh, the, uh, the uh, development one. And the blue one starts out as being the master branch. And you can see it's horrible. It's really high. There's like incredibly high crash rates. And then it suddenly drops. And that's when we decide to cut the release branch. Just before the drop, uh, we cut the release branch, and then we start very aggressively removing anything that's bad from the release. So we don't try to fix it in the release branch. That's what the development branch is for. We just back out anything that's not ready, because four weeks later, we're going to have another branch cut anyway, so it can wait four weeks. And so that's what takes that crash line from like crazy high to all the way down below. Um, although this is real-time data I actually gathered earlier today. Um, it looks like it's kind of spiking up at the end there, so we have a regression on our um, release branch, and that's obviously a bad thing. Um, so anyway, this is how we're going to get you know, the release branch stable and ready to release uh, whenever we, uh, at the end of a four-week period. And then, you know, if we're on Android, great, we, get, we release the, uh, the app. If we're on iOS, it goes off to review, and you know, fingers crossed everything works well, and then we can release the, um, the app. So that's kind of what the cycle looks like. And by the way, this, you know, this happens all the time for all the different apps. And actually, we cut a release branch while I was talking. Um, I just checked that earlier. At 5 PM today, we cut a release branch for one of our apps. Um, so this is really continuously happening. So there's a couple of things. Like, there's a couple of points I just want, to, uh, want you to take home on you know, how we're approaching this. And they're really driven by the culture we want to have. So, there are a few things we just really don't want to compromise on. And the first one is how long it takes for changes to make it into production. We don't want people to wait for months for their changes to make it into production. That's, that's a terrible situation for anyone. It doesn't benefit the users at all. We also don't want to compromise on impact and ownership. The engineer owns their code throughout, and they have as much impact now. We want them to have as much impact as they would have done when we were joining a tiny little startup called Facebook um, many, many years ago. And finally, uh, we obviously can't compromise on quality. We have you know, 600 million users on mobile. Um, that's why 
we build the testing in from the very start, like before changes ever make it into, into trunk, and like try to continue throughout. So there's a bunch of things you haven't heard me talk about. Um, UI automation is kind of the obvious one. Performance testing on native devices is definitely another one. That doesn't mean these are things we just don't want to do. Um, it just means we kind of have to start somewhere. So hence the sort of our slogans, uh, we're 1% done. And it's definitely true in this case, so we um, love to hear your ideas on this. And I think with that, I'll um, just open it up for questions. So the Facebook web, mobile website is still up. Are you, do you still have a process for that? Is it the same process it was before? So I, the, reason, the only reason I didn't talk about the mobile website, which by the way is hugely important, it has like a lot of users, um, is that it's exactly the same process as the desktop. It's actually the same repository. When we push out desktop, we also push out mobile. Uh, I mean the mobile website. Um, it's just the same code base. So that'll go out nine times a week, pretty much. Yeah. How Facebook does a uh, real browser, a uh, real device uh, testing? Um, by real people using it at the moment is the only answer I can uh, give you. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't want to do automated real device testing, but that hasn't been high on our priority. Um, so what uh, automated UI testing we have is simulator based. It will be, um, I know we're building out some stuff for, uh, native device test, uh, real device testing, but right now it's only dog fooding. Uh, Damien, what kind of scale are we talking about? You got 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people dog fooding? Um, order of magnitude, 1,000 people. 1,000 engineers. Uh, two questions, I've already forgotten the second one though. Uh, the first one was what unit testing framework are you using? Um, that is a... That's a good question, which actually Roy can answer, because, oh, by the way, I don't actually know anything. Uh, Roy and Christian over there know things. Um, I just talk about stuff. Um, <laughs> I know the infrastructure. I don't know the code. Oh, I can, I can repeat that, by the way, if you want. Um, JUnit and RoboElectric um, for the unit test on Android, and um, we're looking at EasyMog for... So we're currently oh. Using EasyMog, and we have Okay, we what are about, current... What about for iOS? Uh, Just because you don't know or because it's super secret? Because you don't know because it's super secret? Oh, Okay. Uh, how does Facebook handle the hard fix if uh, you notice from the user review that something really bad happened in user device? How do you handle that? So there's certainly like, this is the release cycle excluding hotfixes, uh, both for the website and, um, and, for, native, and for native apps. Uh, we always have the option of doing a hotfix. It's a fa we consider it a failure if we have to do that, obviously. Um, for mobile, we don't really have a, you know, we don't have a way of turning, uh, turning old apps off. Um, so, yeah, we don't have a fantastic story there. For the web, we can just, like, pull off the old release and, um, and roll out a new one. For, for mobile, we can roll out a new one. We can't make people upgrade. I have a question, which is, um, uh, have you noticed any sort of disconnect between uh, Facebook's engineering culture uh, and the engineering culture of sort of the iOS development community at large, um, specifically with regard to automated testing? Um, that's, uh, I think there is a bit of a there is a bit of a disconnect. Um, I think in the sense that, at least I can't speak to the like general iOS engineering community, but I think one thing we see time and time again when you know people come in come to and talk to us about really cool tools and so on that, a lot of the time we're basically unable to make them fit into that process because they're very much focused on um, helping people who don't want to code write tests and write auto, do the automated testing. We're actually focused on helping engineers do automated testing. So that's, that's the impedance mismatch from our point of view. Like what we want to see, because you know, we get tools where the sales pitch is like, and you don't have to write a line of code. I'm like, no, we do. We like writing lines of code. Um, that's, that's the biggest disconnect I see, I guess. The, uh, the other big thing that I think Facebook does differently, not only just for mobile, but for engineering in general, is that we don't have a dedicated QA team. Um, we have engineers who work on testing tools, but if you're a developer, nobody writes your tests for you. Nobody writes your test plan for you. That's your responsibility. 
Um, so I kind of, with what Damien was saying, a lot of the tools that we've seen tend to be focused more on like a dedicated QA person's uh, life, not necessarily like the full engineer. Is that true for mobile uh, also? Uh, yeah, that's, that's essentially true for mobile also. There's a, I think for, for mobile, there is a very small amount of manual QA work that happens, uh, but it's basically true for mobile. Yeah, there's, there's no large QA effort there. Yeah, and it's still like if, the, if, the, if a manual QA person catches the failure, it's still kind of considered a failure because we should have tried to get, we should have caught it upstream. Yeah, it's more of a last line of defense right, kind of like thing. it's more like the last line of defense, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So do you guys um, foresee uh, unit tests plus dog putting falling short and you guys moving to automated UI testing at some point or do you think you're covered with what you got right now? Uh, no, I, I, I think we need, I, I do think we'll need automated testing and automated UI testing and, and pretty soon. Um, I think that that will always be focused on a relatively small part of the, um, not, not necessarily, we don't necessarily feel the need to cover every last bit of the app with automated um, UI tests, but the crucial things, um, we need a way to keep the unit tests honest, basically. Errors should be caught by the unit tests, but if people haven't been, you know, writing their unit tests well enough, we need something that will catch that. Um, and the, where we would want to start there is there's a lot of stuff that dog fooders don't catch because there's a lot of things they don't do. We don't log into the app, right? We're already logged in. Um, we need, you know, obviously we want something that will actually check the login flow works apart from the unit test because if we break that, it's kind of bad. Um. Is there any specific code coverage tools that you guys use? Uh, how do you know your unit tests are uh, covering you well? So actually, like Roy's intern has a diff out for um, adding code coverage to Android using Emma. Um, we actually, so we have code coverage in um, in our PHP code base um, as well as well as it as just soon, landed. Oh, it just landed. Okay, so now we have code coverage for Android. Um, we don't set targets for code coverage. We view it as an aid for reviewers. So the idea is that like, you know, we show it on like a, a bar of the side of a code review. It's like it's red lines are not covered and blue lines are covered. Um, the idea is like the reviewer looks at that and goes like, this is a crazy complicated change and I see no blue at all on the right. Um, do something about it. Um, so we don't, we're not aiming for a particular target. This is just another signal that we want to use for code review. I want to refer back to the thing we heard about the fellow who is not supposed to click on the cow a thousand times. A thousand engineers do not a billion users all around the world make. So I'm a little bit skeptical about the representation you know, of the population when you have a thousand engineers dog fooding. I don't know about you, I'm even in QA and I know how to avoid the pitfalls and not you know, step in the cracks. Oh yeah, so the, certainly the, you know, we don't consider dog fooding to be like how we're trying to catch errors. That's really for the automated, uh, automated testing that happens before that. It is very, very helpful to us. It certainly catches low hanging fruit. Uh, but one reason, just to like further illustrate that, there's another reason, there's a particular reason why we don't want dog fooders to be catching lots and lots of errors and that we're actually using the damn things. Um, we need Facebook for work. Uh, we do a lot of work on Facebook. Uh, if it keeps crashing all the time, that's great. We found errors in the app, but we also can't really work effectively while we're doing that. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, so, you know, the, in the diagram I had with the, you know, crash rates on, uh, on the master branch uh, going down to release, that crash rate is not very high. Like, we don't, um, the quality is, most of that has happened earlier. And, so far, we've been pretty pretty happy with how many errors we found, um, how few errors have actually made it into production. Uh, we haven't, uh, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but for the, since we released the native iOS app, we have not had to hard fix it. Um, Christian is, yes, that's right. Cool, Christian releases these things, so he knows. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's been out there for a while, and it's, it, we're pretty happy with it, so. 
but I agree, when a like, thousand engineers is not the same as a billion, well, 600 million real people. Um, not that engineers aren't real people, but. Yeah, I'll just talk to that real quick. Um, so I also came from Mozilla before, and Mozilla has, I think, around five million beta testers, and they still find bugs when they ship. So yeah, dog fooding is not gonna find stuff. When you ship to millions of people, you find the one in the million bugs. Um, so yeah, it's just another check. We do a lot up front. All right, I wanna say thank you to Damien.